Okay, I got the any time, so I'm going to start. I am John Below. For those of you that don't know me, I am the head of InfoSec at uh, Jasper AI. We're an AI company that does marketing stuff. Um, I also uh, serve on the board for Salt Lake CISO, which is a group of local heads of security and CISOs. I made a mini badge for SaintCon last last year, and we lost them for since then. But we found them, and I have a few extra. So I took some up to the Soldering Village, which I recommend you stop by. And there's a few left here. So if you want a cool mini badge that uh, I made my kids help me design, then uh, come grab one. Um, and then I'm also a uh, an advisor at a VC firm called Tola Capital. Uh, I also recently survived Disneyland, and this is John 2D2, which I designed, which I'm very happy about. Um, okay, let me talk about why I'm here a little bit, what I want to talk about. So I've been working in this AI space for about two years, um, and I've seen some interesting things. And as I talk to colleagues and, and uh, other people in the security field about it, they always find it super interesting. So two takeaways from that. For, for, for everybody here, if you haven't presented at a conference like this, um, you should do it. Things that you do are interesting to other people, even if you don't think they are, because this is something that I had to be convinced of. Um, so I recommend that you do that. And then two, uh, AI is a weird space, uh, and people are very confused about like how to deal with it. So, uh, you know, we've, we've had kind of this explosion in, in uh, what's been happening uh, in the AI space over the last couple of years. When I started at Jasper, ChatGPT wasn't out, and it was really hard to con like talk to my family and friends about what I did. They had no idea what I was talking about. It's much easier since ChatGPT is out, which is nice. But since then, there has been this like explosion of, of AI systems that have come out for various use cases, um, and more and more we are seeing these systems come into play in the companies that we work in. Uh, and it introduces a lot of potential issues. We have to do kind of review as security professionals. That's kind of where I'm speaking from. We have to do reviews of all these systems and make sure they're safe and data is not being leaked through them um, and all this stuff. And like this was a headline that I just pulled uh, this week that, you know, these are like 100 new partners that Google announced at Next um, this year. So with all of this proliferation of, of AI systems everywhere, everywhere, what do we do? Well, our responsibility is like to do third-party vendor assessments, right? F with a show of hands, who has done this? Who has like evaluated a third party that your company uses? Cool. Who likes to do that? Is that, is that a thing? Okay, listen, I, I've talked to people who like to do it. I don't know, I'm not in that boat but I've talked to people who, uh, who do it. So evaluating third parties in general, I feel like once AI came into the mix, it not only became harder, but more confusing to figure out how to do these reviews, um, but I don't think it has to. So uh, let me jump in really quick. Um, th this is just another explanation. Third party risk is all over the place. Um, it's difficult to do in general. Uh, fourth party risk is also like a thing, this actually came up in a conversation um, th that I was in a few months ago, that you know there was a four, fourth party breach, how do we even do fourth party reviews? And I also think that there's evidence that there is fifth parties that you might need to review also, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna get into that. Okay, so let me jump into a little bit about first how to do um, uh, vendor risk assessments, um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about kind of how we apply that to AI stuff. I recognize it's 2.30 on a Friday, so just keep the snoring to a minimum during like the vendor risk assessment part, that's all I ask. Um, so the first thing you need to go do when going into one of these evaluations is what kind of third party are, are you looking at? Uh, and, and then consider ranking those. If you're looking at a financial service company, um, you know, like a card provider or, or a bank provider, it's going to be very different than like your swag provider. Now, we have learned through difficult times that both of those systems can be exploited, but 
you, you're probably going to look at the risks of those systems differently. Um, and then look and decide what, what types of risks you want to look through. So this was like a, a list that I just pulled off the interwebs about like the, some types of, of risk that you might want to look at. Um, and again, this is going to be different, right? You're not, probably not going to have a lot of downstream risk from a swag vendor, but if you, if you have a large language model powering a, you know, an HR system that you have, like there could be some, some serious downstream risk uh, to that getting exploited or, or having problems there. Um, same kind of thing if you're, if you're using AI to power um, even a development experience, right? Like if, that, if there is injection that happens there, there is one serious operational risk if you can't deploy code anymore, um, but again, downstream risk to other, other areas. Okay. I, rec I highly recommend that before you get, get into a, one of these reviews or especially into like a meeting with a third party that you're reviewing, know who you're talking to. Like, uh, so w one of the motivations for doing this is I've been on like the receiving end of these reviews like hundreds of times now after two years. And you know, not only because it's an AI system, but because people come ill prepared. I've heard this phrase from like the security person on the call to like, their marketing counterpart. What are we, what, are, what is this? What are we looking at? What does this do? You know, they often enter these situations knowing nothing. And so, uh, you know, don't, don't be Andy Dwyer here. Know what you're looking at. Um, the other thing that we see a lot, and we see uh, as I'm doing my own like third party vendor reviews, is these AI companies are kind of all over the place, right? And I recognize that as one of them, that there's the two guys in the garage problem um, that many of these companies are, literally are just two guys in a garage building like an AI system from uh, an available model. So know the company you're talking to, uh, know what potential risks you're going to see, that kind of thing. Okay. Once you kind of have an intro, uh, you need to assess the controls. The best companies are going to have an available security portal. Um, I, I'm not going to like uh, shill for one of them, um, but they, you know, there's a bunch out there, and uh, they're, they're all great for this kind of thing. Um, and then if you are the vendor, if you have people doing reviews of your company, have a security portal. It's it's really simple. It makes the whole process significantly easier uh, and it makes everybody happier. So often you're gonna you know, have, a, have a process you're gonna follow, collect reports, SOC 2, ISO, that kind of thing. The next step I think is like kind of obvious, but has to be said, because I've seen the, the opposite. You, you should actually like look at the reports that you collect. Um, I, I've, I've seen this, that People collect these reports and literally don't look at them all at all. There's no follow-up questions. Um, follow-up questions from this kind of thing is, are great. And a, a lot of times they can get you to a better place uh, if you have concerns, risk concerns about a specific company. Um, and then if, you, if you've kind of done the previous step that we talked about, and you've kind of tiered your, your vendors and you know what type of vendor you're looking at, that will kind of help you know how much to dig. But I did want to take a, a minute here Make sure I'm on the right slide. I did want to take a minute here because I realized up until, like, I don't think anybody ever, like, told me how to evaluate a, re a security report. Um, I just kind of made it up and found a lot of things I was doing wrong. So I don't have time to, like, go through this in depth. That's probably a whole other talk. But let me just talk a little bit about SOC 2 report because uh, it's the most common one. It's the one you're going to see the most. Um, first is... A SOC 2 report is not a certification. There is no certification tied to it. It is simply a report on controls that you create. So it's important to rec recognize that. Okay, a SOC 2 report is made up of four primary sections. The first one is the independent audit report. Um, and this is uh, the, the, the description that the auditor writes um, at the very beginning. Um, and often uh, there's going to be terms in there about the kind of the result of the report, like unqualified means the company kind of passed the audit with no, you know, observations that they want to make. Um, qualified that the company did well, but there, you know, might be a couple of areas that you want to pay attention to. Uh, the next one is adverse. 
in that one, the company has failed the audit, essentially, as far as you can fail a SOC 2 audit, um, which is not great. And then uh, there's actually another one that they use, the term they gen generally use is disclaimer of opinion, which means the auditor does not have enough information to, to make an observation or to make a conclusion. Okay, the next one is management's assertion. And this is where you as the company that gets audited gets to write kind of your, uh, your take on the report. So you get to explain what the report is, uh, you get to kind of talk about what your systems are, what the scope is, that kind of thing. That, this is kind of your opportunity to talk about what you want to in the report. Uh, the third one is the system description. Um, the, it's a system description of the controls and of the environment that the controls apply to. Uh, so in here, you're going to have like system scope. You're going to have uh, system components, what infrastructure is used. You're going to list out the control framework. Um, there is going to be a list of any system incidents um, and then um, any, any additional information about user roles, user responsibilities, that kind of stuff. And the last one is a detailed list of controls um, and then what the outcome of the testing was. So in here you're going to have your, like all of your control criteria listed. It'll, this section will tell you the, the, trust, cri the trust criteria uh, that was used. There'll be a control number mapping. Um, all that good stuff. And then there'll also be results um, for each of the controls, whether there was observations or, or issues or whether it was an unqualified report. So I wanted to go over this because I've never s seen anybody do it. I never had the opportunity to do it. I hope this is helpful. All right. Sorry. We'll get to some AI in this, in this talk about AI. Uh, so let me go over just really quickly some, some uh, kind of questions that I think you should consider if the, if the vendor that you're evaluating is heavily focused in AI, right? If there's a, if there's a large language model backing the, the system that they use, consider some of these. And again, just like with some of the other stuff, it's going to depend. Some companies are just kind of shimming AI into their solution and it's, you know, used for one little thing over here. Some are based very heavily and wouldn't function without it. So take that into account. But you're going to want to ask, is this a hosted LLM that they're using, like the API to OpenAI's system, or is this something, um, sorry, I had that back. Is this a public uh, system like OpenAI's, or is this, you know, like an open source LLM that's they're hosting in, in their environment? There's going to be some, like, follow-up questions to that. Um, like, what, what specific version of the model that's being used? The models are being updated very rapidly. Uh, I, I think I saw an announcement that OpenAI released an, an updated version of ChatGPT like this morning, uh, and, but it, it's happening like constantly. So make sure you know specifically what it is, what version's being used. Uh, talk about how it was trained, right? So this is gonna take into account a bunch of these questions around ethics and bias. And, and these are big problems that AI systems have, that, that they are, uh, I, th I think, the argument that I hear people make sometimes is like, the world is biased, right? And so because of that, the, the data that gets fed into AI systems is um, sometimes um, it unintentionally biased. So make sure that there has been some, <coughs> some care taken to remove some of that bias. Consider what ethics has looked like for these companies. Um, we actually did an ethics-related podcast for, for Jasper that, that I was a part of. It was fun. Um, if you want more information about how we do ethics internally or, or like an example of how a company can do an ethics board for AI, it was pretty good. Um, and then how you ensure privacy. I've got a, a slide where we're going to talk about this a little bit here next, but uh, privacy is a big thing around AI models. There's also a whole new host of security tools for LLMs that will protect you against prompt injection, uh, against uh, poisoning of the data set, those are things you, could, you should take into account. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole question around indemnification, especially for systems that generate art and video. Uh, are, are you getting any indemnif indemnification from the provider that you're using? You know, if, if some company comes and decides to sue you for allegedly stealing their art, are you on your own or are you getting any kind of protection? So. I'm sure there's a lot more of these, um, but 
consider the questions that you want to ask to specific uh, AI vendors. All right, OWASP has some great information. This is the first piece I'm going to share from them. They have a whole um, AI security and privacy guide. Now, I'll point out these privacy questions are kind of the same that you would consider for any other system. Um, but you're, you're going to want to understand that, you know, th when, when the system that you're using is collecting uh, PII, <coughs> that that data is only used for the purpose that it was collected. Um, that the data is fair, that you have data rights, that you have the ability to delete data. These are some of the questions you're, you're going to want to ask. Also, um, go to OWASP's website. There's a, a huge detailed um, explanation of all of these. It's a great resource. The next one is uh, more applicable if you're evaluating a large language model uh, in and of itself, or if you're going to use a large language model internally. Um, but OWASP released their top 10 for, for LLMs, and there's some great stuff in here. Um, I talked about prompt injection earlier. There's uh, a company, Lacara, that created that, uh, that cool Gandalf uh, game that everybody played. Um, they actually have now a tool based on the research that they did with that game that prevents and it, you know, is there to prevent and protect against prompt injection. Um, there's a bunch of these, um, and I'll, I'll kind of let you dig into it, but I want to get on to the next stuff um, to talk about. So there's a bunch of regulations in this space also that, that I think you need to be aware of. The first one that I want to talk about is the White House memo on AI that they released, I don't know, I think it was late last year. That memo had three kind of core uh, features to it. One goal was to strengthen AI governance. The next one was to advance responsible AI innovation and then managing risk for AI. Now, a lot of this stuff applies specifically to government use cases, but uh, I, I know there are people here who work for government agencies and some of these principles can be applied and I think it won't be too long before we see kind of general um, legal requirements that, that require some of this stuff. So I wanted to call out some of the um, interesting things uh, in, the, in the memo itself. One is that uh, developers of the biggest LLM systems um, have to share their safety and test results um, with, uh, with the government. There are also developer guidelines for federal agencies where if they're going to use uh, LLMs in their systems, they have to uh, evaluate effectiveness of privacy controls that they have in place. Um, and then there's a couple of specific actions. One that I thought was kind of cool, especially if you're like looking for a new job. Uh, every organization, um, every, uh, the head of every agency has to appoint a chief AI officer uh, within 60 days of the issuance of this memo. So maybe it's too late if you're looking for that job. But um, And then also every agency has to develop plans for res responsible use of AI sharing information that they find from it. If they develop an AI system, they actually have to share the data sets and the weights that were used to, to generate the AI system. So this is a developing space, but there's a lot of requirements that are kind of coming down. The other one that was also passed recently is the EU AI Act um, that, that just went into effect, but I think the way they approached it was pretty cool. They took a risk-based approach to AI systems. They have these four risk categories that categorize AI systems in uh, in one of these four categories. I'm going to go through each of them really quick because we're, we're, we're almost at time here. Um, the, the first one is uh, the unacceptable category. So this is, th these are applications that have the potential for manipulation through like subconscious stuff. Some of this stuff's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, through exploiting vulnerabilities um, and exploiting people with disabilities or, or um, older folks. Um, also in the unacceptable category are social, uh, any, any kind of social scoring system using AI. And then they have also completely banned the use of remote biometric identification systems. And uh, there's a timeline for when all this stuff has to be kind of in effect. I'll, I'll go over at the end. The, the high category is, uh, you know, kind of high risk stuff like biometrics, critical infrastructure, education, um, and then any, uh, any of these high risk uh, AI systems have to be registered with the EU. So they can be used, but the EU wants to know about them. 
And then the limited category is where most of your kind of general purpose AI systems are gonna be. This is where ChatGPT is. Any kind of chatbot that you use is probably gonna fall into this category. A couple of the rules they put in place, you have to ensure that your users know they're interacting with an AI. So you can't hide it, they have to know. And then if you are generating images, <coughs> excuse me, in images, audio, video, all of that has to be disclosed that it is AI generated content. And then there's a minimal category, which is like stuff we've been using for a long time. I kind of consider this more like ML stuff, but it's like video games, spam filters, that kind of thing. And then the, uh, the timeline for these, uh, this stuff is the prohibited stuff has to all be uh, phased out within six months. Uh, within 12 months, all the general purpose rules go into effect for you know, all the general uh, chat GPT style stuff. And then within 24 months, all the regulations take effect. Okay, that's, that's what I have today. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions if there are any, um, but thank you for your time. Yeah, it complementary user entity controls, right? Yeah, so the, the controls that are only in effect if, if the user does the right thing, I guess is a good way to describe it, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, I don't know, is that, do you know if that's an optional part of a report? It's in, it's in all of them, okay. Um, yeah, because there's some stuff that like uh, some audit firms do differently than others. I, um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good thing to point out. The, the top one, the unacceptable. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are forbidden by the EUA Act. Um, that's my understanding. Not, not, a, not a lawyer, not a lawyer. <laughs> oh, uh, so you're asking like, wh what happens if you do it? Or <laughs> yeah, I yeah I think the question is kind of what happens if you use it if if you do this kind of stuff. My th I I don't know. First of all, I'll start there. I I did hear a commentator said that there's likely there's a likelihood this will be enforced similar to how GDPR is enforced. Um, that it's enforced against companies that do this kind of thing. So uh, again very much not a lawyer, but I suspect the, the EU is not going to care as much about individuals that do it, but where they draw that line, who, you know, this just also passed, so I don't know if there's been a lot of discussion about enforcement mechanism. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, the White House one was kind of an early stab, and it was also, uh, the approach was just to cover federal government agencies, essentially, but it, I would expect that's probably a model for any future legislation that does come. Other questions? Oh, you're gonna have to talk loud. If I, sorry, you're kind of far back there, but if I heard it right, the question is how do you figure out what data was used to train a model? Uh, for, yeah, for sure, like, how much information Yeah, uh, sometimes you can't. Uh, that's just uh, the reality of some of the models. Some of the model makers make it kind of public what type, most of them make it public what types of data were used. Like I, I think OpenAI talks about, you know, scanning some percentage of the internet and, and 
kind of where their data sources come from, but uh, it's going to be model dependent. The open source ones are probably more likely to talk about that. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Maybe it's not satisfying, but it's, it's an answer. Okay. This thing says I have, I'm over, right? Is that what this says? Okay. Thank you.